bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. I'm Mark Dolan. It's time for Headliners. This evening, Sajila Kershi and Steve N. Allen come bearing gifts in the form of tomorrow's papers. Big laughs, big opinions, big stories. See you after the headlines. Good evening. I'm Miranda Shunker in the GB Newsroom. The US president says that Vladimir Putin cannot remain in power. The remarks were made during a speech in Warsaw earlier this evening, but the White House responded by insisting it wasn't a call for regime change. Dismissing the comment, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said the president of Russia is a choice for the Russian people. Joe Biden says the war has been a strategic failure for Moscow. Where the appetites and ambitions of a few forever seek to dominate the lives and liberty of many. My message to the people of Ukraine is a message I delivered today to Ukraine's foreign minister and defense minister, who I believe are here tonight. We stand with you, period. If Russia targets Ukraine's nuclear plants, the world is at war. That's according to the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, and his brother Vladimir. The Klitschko brothers told GB News they're grateful to Britain and the U.S. for support, but they need more. We need much more weapons. We need much more help. We have to stop the Russians. The whole world surprised how tough Ukrainian army defend our homeland. Well, in other news, the RMT union is planning to blockade Cairn Ryan Port in Scotland next month to protest against the sacking of hundreds of staff by PO ferries. What do we want? Protests were held at several UK ports today as calls grow for the company boss to quit. Meanwhile, a P&O ferry remains docked in Northern Ireland for being unfit to sail over issues with vessel documents and crew training. The operator replaced 800 seafarers with cheaper agency staff last week. Prince William says it's for the people to decide whether nations in the Caribbean become republics. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge today laid flowers at a memorial to remember the victims of Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas in 2019. The Duke suggested a future decision by the country, Jamaica and Belize, to break away from the monarchy will be accepted by the UK. And the music world has been paying tribute to the drummer of the Foo Fighters, Taylor Hawkins, who's died at the age of 50. Fans gathered outside the Columbian Hotel where Taylor Hawkins' body was found. The rock band are currently on tour in South America. In a statement, lead singer Dave Grohl says the band are devastated by the untimely loss, adding his musical spirit and infectious laughter will live on with all of us forever. Well, on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Headliners. Thank you, Miranda. It's four minutes past 11 and it's time for Headliners. I'm Mark Dolan and every now and again, a comedy pairing comes along that truly excites me. That panel is on next Tuesday's show, but for tonight we've got Sajila Kershey and Stephen Allen. Oh. Great to have you both here. First of all, big news, Steve N. Allen has become a father. Huge congratulations. Thank you, yeah. It's He's great the, news. He's the daddy. Uh, Sajila and I are surprised you're fertile. Thank you, <laughs> yeah. try my best, yeah. It, it, it's a story in the comedy community, <laughs> he did it. I'm assuming with injections and devices. 
Turkey baster. <laughs> Not in the way you think, just I like looking at them. <laughs> that does it. That does it for you. Yeah. Um, it's wonderful news. I mean, you're going to be an amazing daddy, and I'm so happy for you and Mrs. Steve N. Allen. So great, great news. Um, although I'm not flattered, it means that you're not here tonight to deliver topical comedy. You just wanted to get out of the house. <laughs> I can't hear crying right now. It's blissful. I yeah. love it. That's it. In fact, they even bring you tea, which I wouldn't imagine is happening too much round at yours at the moment. No, I mean, he's 11 days old, so we're not letting him try and make tea yet. But I see the point. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Well, look, great news. He is a father and we're going to give birth to a lot of big stories tonight. <laughs> Let's start with tomorrow's front pages. And this is the Sunday Telegraph. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. US policy in chaos as Biden calls for Putin to be deposed. But White House backtracks. We'll be discussing that shortly in the program. Trust sanctions could end if Russia takes the off ramp. That's Foreign Secretary uh, Liz Truss showing a little leg to the Kremlin, suggesting that uh, if this invasion ends, perhaps sanctions could be eased. The Independent now, voters urge Johnson to ditch limits on refugees. The Observer, Biden, butcher, Putin cannot be allowed to stay in power. West must prepare for a long fight ahead. Sunday Mirror, royals on Commonwealth, wills let the people decide, shock statement on Caribbean tour. The Sunday Times, NHS maternity scandal victims were silenced. 300 babies lost to a fixation on natural births. Putin has to go, declares Biden. And number 10 plans another tax rebate. Sunday Express, last but not least, solve cost of living crisis or you will lose the election. Tory MPs have warned Rishi Sunak that he needs to do more to tackle the cost of living crisis after a devastating poll revealed the issue could lose them the next general election. And those are your front pages. Let's kick off with Sunday's Observer, which is leading with Putin the Butcher, Sajila. Ah, right. So Joe Biden has condemned uh, Vladimir Putin as a butcher who can no longer stay in power uh, in a historic speech in Poland, he was visiting Poland. So what happened is while he was, he was there, um, the city of Lviv has been attacked and um, it's, it's closest sort of, Ukraine's closest border to Europe. So it's almost like uh, um, Lviv's, uh, Lviv's uh, mayor, Andriev Sadovy, uh, mm. has said that the explosions were a way of saying hello to President uh, Biden, who was in Poland, but the good thing is that no one's been um, seriously harmed. And it's, it's almost like he's goading uh, Biden to get involved, you know, and Biden's retaliated, uh, you know, with good old American, don't even think about moving one single inch of to NATO territory. Mm. I'm imagining that's what he talks like. Yeah. I don't know why I've given like, that like voice. Like Clint thing. Eastwood or John Wayne or something. Yeah, John Wayne, yeah, is just coming in, you know, starting up. But I mean, Biden, I, I, can't, I can't be scared with, you know, he doesn't seem like an imposing figure, yeah. but he's giving the talk at the moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it really does seem like it was a message for, for Vladimir. And I can't see how America's going to kind of stay out of this. Because, you know, by, if history's told us anything, they, they do eventually always love eventually, to get... Eventually, yeah. Eventually get... They will. They will get involved, I think. Well, Steve N. Allen, I'm concerned about this belligerent tone struck by Joe Biden. The front page of The Telegraph, for God's sakes, this man can't remain in power. US policy in chaos as Biden calls for Putin to be deposed, but White House backtracks. Well, I'm not sure why you'd be too worried about it. It's the classic way of operating at the moment. You have... A leader who would say big words, tough words, and then the mm. actual policy might not fit it. It's not as if Biden's invented that as a, a, a presidential strategy. The last guy did a fair bit of that as well. For sure. But I think it's nice to have some tough talking. There's been way too much of this, oh, we don't want to be too successful in the way which we fight back against Putin in case he might escalate. That's no way to win a conflict. Now, I realise we're not directly involved, but we need to have a role. The whole article talks about messages that Putin sent into the West. This is not just about Ukraine, this is about the West. So let's take the hint already. But I've got no doubt that you are an instinctive pacifist. And I wonder whether the tone struck by Liz Truss is a better one, our foreign secretary, who says that sanctions could end if Russia takes the off-ramp. I mean, surely we, we need a bit more carrot and a bit less stick at this point, because Putin's not going anywhere. The idea that he would be deposed 
is for the birds, isn't it? Yes, but I think we need, uh, it's not, there's a sum total of carrot and stick that we need to hit. We need more stick, more carrot. You're right, you need that off ramp to mm. manage to de-escalate things. But it's not going to happen unless there's a threat of things not going Putin's way, which it seems to be. This has not rolled out the way he thought it was going to be. It wasn't a four-day operation mm. and then home in, home in time to have your dinner on that massive table. So I think it's right to have the big words, the tough words, and the offer of, you know, it's, it's uh, but, but nice ha nasty one. Hasn't Biden, though, set himself up for a fall because he's calling for Putin to be deposed, which means that if Putin stays, then America looks weak? I mean, the thing is, this, it's, it's like all human relationships. It might just be world leaders, but it's still human relationships. And so if you goad someone, they are finally going to either, you know, it's like, oh, do you really, really, really? Uh, yeah. That's kind of, imagine two blokes in the pub and it's just And they, it's they, say, do, they say, do you want some? Do you and want when some? they say, do you want some, they don't it's mean like, crisps. I don't know what it is that you, what is the sum that we want? They're not, they're not offering you peanuts, are they? They're not, they're not. They're, what is the sum do you want? <laughs> and I don't think, so it's kind of effectively, that's what's happening, but so, a bit with two big world leaders. Yeah, well, of course, that story will run and run. A disturbing story about infant mortality next in the Sunday Times, Steve. I mean, I I have to say, this is my first show back after taking <laughs> so, some time off. I did wonder. I was there at the birth, you know, being the at the side of the birthing pool, and then I had to read this story, which is so heartbreaking. Yeah. Honestly, I'm I'm tearing up on the tube on the way in thanks to this. Um, yeah. it, I, so, uh, sorry if I don't make a lot of sense, but this is appalling. This report's coming out about an NHS campaign in Shrewsbury which promoted natural births. And what we're going to find in this story is a lot of phrases that are actually OK, yeah. but the way in which some people respond to them aren't. So, natural births, what a lovely phrase. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, the idea that you don't want to over-medicalise a birth. Well, the word over in that sentence tells you what's going wrong with um births. And they were proud of that. So they did extra to try and maintain that lowest rate. Then you're measuring the wrong thing. You're yes. trying to keep a title when it's not about the title. Like, put it this way. Breathing is a natural process. But, you know, if you need a respirator, I want a flipping respirator. Mm. Correct. So if someone needs a cesarean birth, then you need it. Don't worry about your statistics. Yeah. So it's, it's that story. It's hundreds of lives been affected. Families, you know, mothers dying, babies dying, families being ripped apart. There is no, there's no way to read this story and not be upset. I would honestly say, if you're a new parent, maybe read this newspaper in a few weeks because this story hits hard. Yeah, I mean, you might, wouldn't you, uh, potentially want to curtail elective uh, caesarean section mm -hmm. operations. That's when somebody puts it in the diary, yeah, yeah. too posh to push. But yeah. this is a different story. No, this is a different story. And um, I don't, I, I, I'm always a bit suspicious when, when hospitals or, or people that have got our health care want to reach figures, like let's mm. bring the figures down with what you just said there, just like, I was like that. And I think back in the day when I had my son, um, there was pressure to have uh, pain relief. I didn't have any pain relief, I had a natural birth. And hardcore. it was it, it, hardcore, no pain relief. I don't think I planned it that way. It was just like, oh, oh, okay, I might have something now. No, no, it's too late. And then I had, you know. What did you do? Did you just like punch your husband or something like that? What was, <laughs> what was your? I was just. It, no, what I was just, your outlet? <laughs> what was my outlook? Um, he, yeah, I, I think I swore. I swore in a different language <laughs> at the midwife, and the midwife goes, "I'm really busy down here. I can't hear what you're saying because I knew that if I should, I shouldn't swear in English." Because, you know, this could, like, get worse for me. I'm really busy down here is what but, yeah, got yeah, you in that state in the, the first figures, place. <laughs> the, exactly. She was very busy down there. But the figures, like, then was, like, to breastfeed. And nobody tells you that you're not... I didn't buy any bottles or anything. And nobody tells you that, you know, it might not be as easy as they make out. And then you're made to feel a failure. So all these, like, figures and statistics that they meet. And this is appalling. This is really sad because, you know, mothers have lost their babies. Yeah. But have had brain damage. Appalling story. Devastating. Next uh, story from The Observer about profiteering in children's care providers, Sajila. Um, so top 10 children's care providers have made £300 million in profits. Now, this is bearing in mind that um, uh, we've had the pandemic and they're still in profit. Now, I suspect what happened there was people, um, you know, having a hard time during the pandemic and, and would be more generous towards the children's charities. Yeah. And what you have to consider is that um, I have this feeling that in, the, in two parts of your life, the early part of your life and the latter part of your life, um, you are the most vulnerable. So vulnerable children's care is, it's, you know, it, it can be really problematic. Yeah. They don't necessarily get the care that they need. And also um, the elderly in, in, in care also have a problem. 
And in this situation where social um, care placements um, are made by the local councils who don't have enough money, and then you've got these largest providers of children who, who get private like money, charity money, mm. who've got, who are in profit, who should be spending that money on the care for the children. And, and a lot of the times the kids are, um, you, you know, they're either moved away too far away from their support network because it's cheaper, you know, to live in those areas, or they're put in families that are just completely wrong for them, yeah. the wrong fit. And I, I just think that if you are in 300 million pound profit, there is something drastically wrong. And the reason why I think there is something drastically wrong because they were all asked, so Outcomes First, Care Tech, Polaris and Asperis were asked for comment but declined to do so or didn't respond. Why did you not respond? Because if there's nothing, you know, weird or sinister, then you'd, you'd expect them to respond and say, well, we have got this profit, we're going to put it into, you know, some sort of care. Yeah, it's telling. And the youngest in our society are surely the most important. And should we be profiting at their expense. Uh, really tough news in the world of rock, Steve. Are you a Foo Fighters fan? Yes, definitely. Brilliant so fan. A, yeah, and such a sad. And also the age, which we're going to go on to about what mm. a terrible age to die at. As, you know, we're all getting older. Dying at 50, it's no age yeah. at all. We're all getting closer to it. Um, but it's it was so great to, to see the Foo Fighters rocking at that age, which I really quite liked as well. But the story we're talking about here is, of course, more sad news about the Foo Fighters drummer uh, Taylor Hawkins passed away. The story in the mirror talks about how the latest theory is that the death would be linked to drugs. Already, this is tasteless, isn't it? Do we need this? Where's you? There's no public interest in this. I don't need to know the cause of death. And in fact, the police in, in Bogota said the cause of death is yet to be established. According to those close to him, the death could be related to the consumption of drugs. That first bit, the cause of death is yet to be established. Oh, get back to me when it's established. I can wait because there's no public interest in starting the rumour mill. Do we need to have this? Well, when any celebrity dies, that's yeah. the first thing I do. That's the first thing I want. So I'm totally in disagreement with you because I want to know. I always want to know. And I'm a oh, Foo Fighters fan. public interest isn't want to know. It's yeah, to know. It, it, Well, yeah, if I, I think like you don't want to because you think it's a bit... You're ever so sensitive because you're some new daddy. Look at you glowing. No, I know. Because <laughs> actually, I think I think we were on the show when we the same stories were breaking about Shane Warne in the same way. That, oh, if someone's died at a relatively young age, let's start the rumour mill. Why? Is it a rumour mill? But is it just like asking what it is? It, it, I mean, let's face it, it's a rock and roll. You know, well, I think you want to know if they were so miserable that they killed themselves and if it wasn't that, that they were so addicted to a substance that they overdosed. And then if it was natural causes, you would obviously accept that. But either way, fans will need to process the news in order to know what to deal with that information. But it's not news yet, is it? When we know the cause of death, yeah. at some point, someone will do some sort of chemical analysis to see what drugs are in his system. For sure. But we For are sure. also... It was in Colombia, in Bogota, He's known to have used heroin in the past, so there is an assumption that people can Yeah, make. it's an easy and yeah. quite lazy guess, isn't it? Yeah, well, I guess uh, I guess uh, it's, it's a reflection of character and Sajila and I. Rock and roll. Really. <laughs> rock and roll. If we're honest, dreadful people. Yeah, um, but, uh, dreadful people. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I love them. I'm not I'm not. Yeah, guessing. exactly. Incredible band and uh, a tragic, very sad story. Well, on to Sunday's Metro now. More on the P&O scandal. And there are protests at ports, Sajila. Well... Yes, protesters have taken to ports across the UK to rally against this uh, job massacre, as you may recall. Um, you know, so what happened? What happens when you sack 800 people, like on the Zoom version of Dear John letter? Yeah. You know, what happens is that, um, you know, basically you're doing a shoddy fire and rehire model when you replace uh, experienced staff with inexperienced agency but, you know, uh, below, like, minimum wage, is that, you know, you're going to get protesters coming out and the unions are going to cry out. And so the protests have been going, uh, came just hours after um, a ship operated by a ferry firm was detained in Northern Ireland for being unfit to sail. I wonder why, because everybody's now going to be looking at PMO and saying, well, you're not fit for purpose, you're going to be regularly checked. Um, they, in Dover, there were scenes that crowds carried banners and placards calling for the end to the PO job carve-up. Um, people were chanting, uh, a shame, P or no, shame on you. I love that one, a shame, a shame on you. I love those protests, I love it. Yeah. Um, that's when people really come together when they protest. And the Trade Union Congress, TUC, tweeted a video they said showed the P&O docker, P dockers in Rotherham refusing to load freight uh, into a ferry set for Hull in solidarity. So this is going to spark up a huge thing. Um, the chief executive, Pete uh, Hebel, Hebelweight? Hebelweight. 
Heatherweight. Is that what I pronounced it right? Yeah, it is yeah. Heatherweight. Well, yeah. he's, you know, he's sacked 800 people. So I don't care if I'm pronouncing it. Well, he's, he's a nobody now. He's persona yeah. non grata. So persona non grata. He's, P, he's, he's P45. Exactly. P45. I think, I think he, needs to go. he needs to go. <laughs> and you've not had any sleep. That's <laughs> impressive. Know. That's as good as it's going to get. He's, he's, he's high on cowpole, this guy. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that is that is uh, it is a scandal, and they have admitted effectively that they interpreted the rules in a very uh, controversial way, and the government are going to uh, going to uh, tie the uh, loophole. Are you worried that your corporate gigs on the cruises are going to suffer? <laughs> have you ever performed on it on a cruise ship? No, I was thinking that like this would be a boycott that I would be willing to take part in, but yeah. I've never been asked to perform on a cruise, and also don't take a lot of cruise holidays, so yeah. it's not going to hit them that hard. I was a cruise ship uh, comedian for a while, no. and, and when it goes well, it's great because you've got a week of being a legend, you know, high fives with everyone. But uh, if it doesn't go well, that's a long seven days. <laughs> On to the Observer. We all thought that the phone hacking scandal was ancient history, but apparently not, Steve. Not that ancient, with Rupert Murdoch's news group newspapers has failed in an attempt to have a deadline for potential victims of phone hacking to make claims against it. And maybe you should have thought of that before hacking people's phones. There was a way around this. The idea that they're saying it's been 15 years and more people are coming forward and making claims, should there be some form of a statute of limitations on this? I mean, there is a maximum number of people who will make claims, and that's equal to the number of people who are hacked. So if you want that number to be smaller, should have stopped sooner. Now, there's been a, just over 1,000 claims already made, plus an extra nearly 400 applications made. The thing is, though, according to some experts, there could be over 20,000 people possibly affected by this. So one way to expedite the system would be to tell us who they were. Because some of the victims don't know they're victims. This is why you can't have a limit mm. on this. Because if you suddenly find out 17 years later you were part of this, what, you've missed the boat. So, no, I think it's, it's gone the right way. They've not been allowed to have a limitation on it. So do you think this will be unlimited, do you? Is, does it look like... But no, there is a limit. That's my point. Like, the limit right. is the but, number but, of people... But time-wise, time even in 20 years' time, they'll still have to pay up. If they tell us everyone who was hacked, mm. then you could have a time limit. But the point is, the victims don't know they're victims, so the, why should the clock be running? So don't Gina? you think this could be the new PPI? Yeah. Have you been a victim of phone hacking? <laughs> I know what you mean. Please phone up. And you can get compensation. Yeah. Because I'd love to... Obviously, number. the PPI yeah. scandal was a disgrace. And I did all the applications, <laughs> lastminute.com, just before the cutoff. And I was, uh, I, I was given about £1.50 by Capital One. <laughs> Very disappointed. I thought, I thought I'd be able to retire. But uh, I've still got my Capital One credit card, so well done then. Um, <laughs> Sajila, I, uh, I would never hack your phone. I have never hacked your phone, except I just would say that your dry cleaning is ready. You can collect it <laughs> on Monday. That's the end of part one. But don't go anywhere because we've got some cracking talking points coming up. The possibility of a Jamaican Republic, a man stopped by police for wearing a thick coat, and London shoppers battling over watches. Find out why in two minutes. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News.
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Headliners, a romp through tomorrow's papers with me, Mark Dolan. Tonight, I'm joined by two people who are to live comedy what Sillit Bang is to face wash. It's Sajila Kershi and the very exfoliated Steve N. Allen. A new must-have timepiece is causing havoc with London shoppers. This in the mail on Sunday, Sajila. I know. So, Swatch. Do you remember Swatch watches? I, I do. Didn't, didn't you know people wore watches anymore, but Swatch closes London watch shop after just 30 minutes as hundreds of shoppers are queued through the night battle for must-have £207 Amiga X watch timepiece that is already selling for more than £3,000 on eBay. Wow, okay, so um, there were queues all over Carnaby Street and London people had like literally camped out. This reminds me of London Harrods sales, you know. So yes, just, back in the day. Yeah. They and and in the early iPhones. Early iPhones. And, and this is all for a moon, moon watch swatch uh, an affordable £207 take on the famous collector's favourite Speedmaster professional, also known as the Moonwatch, worn by an astronaut, an astronaut, they don't say which astronaut, an astronaut walking on the moon during the Apollo 2 mission. So surely there was only going to be two of the astronauts, is that right? And which astronaut wore it then? Well, yeah, you wonder about that, don't yeah. you? But the thing is, it, 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 what they did was they created a hype, which is great, um, but couldn't meet the demand. And I think at the end, only 10 people actually got the watch. And people were... People who have been committed all night long. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think in fairness, they should have got it first, right? What happened was people were coming in, latecomers, and then pushing, pushing. That's all British, is it? People who turn up late are the ones who need a watch, so... Ah, <laughs> I see where you go with that. <laughs> yeah, they should prove that they're not, really bad not... at timekeeping. I, I, I've just been looking at this watch online. It doesn't look like anything special. I know, it's, 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 it ain't all that. And I don't know, be, I've never queued up for anything. You might do now, because I did queue up. Yeah. Uh, for a outside Woolworths for a Teletubby Lala uh, for my son, and I was—I tell you, I would have—I would have punched. I used to use my handbag as a weapon to get that Lala, uh, and that was as a mother. And you will probably do this as a new parent because there will be the must yeah, toy of every. You've done it, so must toy. But of Buzz Lightyear a few Buzz years Lightyear. ago. Buzz yeah. That was another one you couldn't get. And yeah. when I was a kid, uh, it was just a, a wooden horse. Exactly. Oh. I'm still, you know, I still identify as my original Northern. I realise I live in the South now, but I want my kid to understand the misery of Christmas. <laughs> Just like I had when I was growing up. The lack of fulfilment <laughs> of those expectations. He's going to get that every year. Now yes. you're talking. Let's crack on because we've got lots more stories to get through. This one in the Sunday Times and trans activists have been kicking off about a conference on gender dysphoria. Steve, tell me this story. So... The, it was an NHS child psychiatrist conference, as you say, on gender dysphoria. It's been cancelled. What is gender dysphoria? Well, I think we'd have found out if you could go to the um, conference. <laughs> and it, it's part of where but we, it's, it's the idea of some, when someone is confused about or, or just not sure what gender they have. Yeah, and it's difficult to know whether the word confused would be appropriate because it, yeah. it's... It is a very difficult area to be picking the right words. Right. However, what's happened is uh, it's cancelled after, as they say in the article, transgender rights activists accused speakers of extremism. Then a couple of sentences later, um, saying that people said it was captured by anti-trans ideologues. Either way, there's a big long list of people who were going to be speaking at it and pulled out for various reasons, whether people complained about them or they said, well, I'm not going to be on this thing if she's on this thing. Scrap all of that and just she, get... She, her. Yeah, get to the point of saying, look... It's a difficult area. Surely we can try and find the bits that we agree on, because at the moment, everyone is just chasing the extreme part of this. How can I be more offended by what the other group have to say? Whereas, surely we can agree, this is a time when trans rights need to be looked at. There's, there's no way you're saying that the system is perfect at the moment. So how are we going to do that? By having conversations. And it might mean listening to people that you disagree with. And hopefully, in talking about this, I've not tried to use any words that pick a side. Mm. It's true of both sides. That if you refuse to take part in a discussion, you're not going to educate someone or be educated by someone. So I find it slightly disappointing that people are so uh, happy to shut down the people they disagree with 
that we're just going to end up with loads of stories about things being cancelled, and that's not going to help people who are trans, who need more rights. Now, Steve's right that we have to have a conversation about that. We know the trans community are some of the most marginalised and prejudged in our society. But did Boris Johnson clear up the situation in the Commons this week simply by saying, yes, we must uh, actually support people that have transitioned, but that biological sex trumps all? Is that the solution? Uh, has, he, uh, has he fixed it for you? I don't know. I guess he hasn't fixed it. I think it's just a political statement, just like the Labour have done with a political statement on this. You know, they've just got their own corners to sort of try and get their, garner their vote. And I can only speak as a woman, uh, a, a, a woman not like one of the placards I had, a, a, you know, a woman with a penis is still a woman. No, not in my world, that isn't. Uh, but that's going to perhaps, you know, offend you who might be a little bit more sort of, but I'm not anti-trans, I'm, you know, 100% trans rights, you know, within my own culture. You know, we've, we've got it sussed with when it comes to trans, but it just hasn't got sussed when it comes to gay rights. Still, oh, why? What is the know? solution so in your culture? Uh, but it, because we just have a name for them. They're hijras, they're kutras, you know, in India and Pakistan. That's, that's, that, they have their own community. And like, when you say, oh no, this is a woman, no, it's a trans woman. It's a trans woman. And I noticed that we're not having the argument on the other side where females, born no, biological females, are transitioning to men. We don't have that same kind of anger or upset. Men aren't saying that this is a men-only space is because there, that isn't an issue. There's still actually misogyny for women who tr are transitioning to men. I agree with you. I, I, and I, I don't think anybody who questions biology is ever saying that they're against trans rights. And that's got to be absolutely 100% clear. We are all for trans rights. What we're saying is we need to, to need to talk about when you start changing the language for a woman, when you start saying that a woman with a penis is a woman and you've got a placard, when biology and facts are staring at you in the face, then there's something drastically wrong where people are literally being brainwashed. And I do think it's quite young for people that seem to be caught up with this zeitgeist that literally you're being brainwashed into thinking this is the way of doing it. And I'm just thinking, what's happening to our young people? It's like the village of the damned. There's some sort of, you know, telepathic kind of messages that are going around that I've not been invited to that, like, telepathy. I've not been, you know, I'm not in that wavelength. You didn't get the memo. I didn't get the memo. But what about the person that went and it was a trans woman, therefore born a biological male, who complained about period pains? I mean, at that point, we've jumped the shark, haven't we? I, I know what you mean. Yeah, look, I think we can all sit around and try and find the thing that probably has been covered in the Daily Mail, which is the best example of the extreme argument, the ad ridiculum argument. And that then means we're not spending time on the actual centre part of this issue, the, the, the part where we could agree where the two sides of the argument could come together to actually start moving rights in the right direction. So I'm, I know I'm not really playing the role of someone who's on a comedy show now by going, I take your part, your point, <laughs> and I thoroughly ignore it and come up with a serious one. Yeah, there are loads of these news stories that are kind of so... I agree that we need ridiculous. a dialogue, I do. But at the end of the day, like, it is also something that involves women, and women are being kind of absent, being, you know, you're not allowed to be in this Why conversation. Why not? You, you could be at a, a conference. I could have been at the conference. Yeah, but it gets cancelled because people I am aren't willing to guys. talk. <laughs> there you go. Well, talk we will. I'm sure that story is not going to go away. On to Prince William now in the Caribbean. This in Sunday's Observer. Sajila, it hasn't been a great trip, has no, it? No, it, 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 it's been sort of bogged with like problems, and I don't. But well, I do kind of understand actually. And then so, you don't mean that they lost their luggage or couldn't get duty free at well, the airport? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he tried to get in more than 200 fags, and <laughs> um, it's just not on, you know, he's trying to get in some for extra free. Uh, apparently, he's very keen on Paco Raban aftershave. Paco Raban aftershave, but doesn't that, oh, that, that brings back memories, honestly. What, what's your brand? Aramis. Aramis. Oh, Aramis. Yes. Yeah. And Amani. Amani. Do you like... Oh, that's I mean, is he Mackie man right now? Uh, oh, look at you. Yeah. Money's See, been spent. You're in showbiz. I can't, I can't even say, smelly. is he Miyake, let alone smell. <laughs> is he Miyake? Is he Miyake? I'm sure Joe Beverly Hills have used it ever since I was very young. And you're but, worth every penny. And Because and, uh, I'm worth it, yeah. So the Duke and Duchess basic controversial tour, they call it a controversial tour of the Caribbean, uh, is drawn to a close. And what the essence of this article is that um, Prince William has signalled that the UK would support with pride and respect the decision of Jamaica Belsize and the Bahamas to break away from the British monarchy. Now, obviously, the Queen isn't getting any younger, and you know we are going to be facing a, a new king. So it's right that they move on from this. And I think the controversy, um, which a lot of people have been poo-pooing, is it's around you know slavery um, and uh, also um, you know the stuff that's happening with Windrush 
And um, it, it's understandable. I do get that. I do get why that would be an issue. And I don't understand when people are saying, oh, isn't it? We shouldn't be, we should have been given, you know, years ago. We should, you know, it's, it's happened so long ago. It doesn't really matter. Well, some of the other stories that we're going to be covering kind of points out that we, it does matter. And it matters to these people. So that's, that's you know. Uh, is an apology enough or is it reparations? I think it's rep yeah, reparation, yes. Because you've got to remember the slave traders themselves were, were actually compensated. But the slaves who had their identities, lives stripped, you know, they, which is what Jamaica is made of, is, it, you know, that, that's their history. They were never compensated. They were never, you know, and that has history runs really, really deep, just like colonialism. Yeah. Uh, well, look, let's move on now to Sunday's independence. Is wearing a thick coat a crime now, Steve? Wearing, by the way, a royal blue blazer clearly isn't. In fact, it's yeah. the opposite of a crime. You should be applauded for your outfit tonight. Well, I, uh, thankfully, you didn't ask me about whether we should have a monocle or not, because I might not have had to take this off. Um, however, uh, yeah, this is the so story. listen, when you came into the studio, I was going to frisk you. So tell me about this story. Yeah, because it's wrong for the weather. Well, the story is the story of uh, Eric Botang Taylor, a black man who was stopped by the Metropolitan Police for wearing a coat during warm weather under suspicious circumstances. I mean, if you're dressed inappropriately for the weather, we're all going to get arrested during spring. That's what happens this time of year, isn't it? You walk out <laughs> thinking, well, it's shirts and shorts. That's exactly right. Then as soon as it gets to five o'clock, oh, absolutely freezing. Yeah. Um, so this is what happened. Um, officers said you're not dressed for the climate. Side note, confusing weather and climate. You're a Trump voter. Um, so <laughs> what we can all agree is it is ridiculous to stop someone for wearing a coat that you think is too thick. Yes. He was then searched, but because of this... You know, the Misuse of Drugs Act was used, but in the, the video, which you can see online, the tip-off was, that's a bit of a funny coat. Surely we all agree no one should be stopped for the coat that they're wearing, so we can ask questions about why do you make some sort of trumped-up accusation against someone to get to stop and search them? Yeah. Let's hope that uh, Lady Gaga doesn't drive around Britain late at night on a Saturday in some I of her outfits and meat dress. I the were his mum. Was it his mum just checking that he had his warm coat on? So have you got your vest on? That's exactly you right. Coat on? Yeah. He's clearly like uh, just a very well brought up young man. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know about you, but I've been wearing the wrong clothes all the time. The weather's going, it's warm and, you know, so I totally relate yeah. to Yeah. And it's got a nasty undertone, hasn't it? There's, yeah, a, there's a hint of racial, bias, yeah. racial profiling, unconscious yeah, yeah, bias and, yeah. and uh, not acceptable. Yeah. Too right. Well, look, uh, let's move on now to prisoners who are about to take up the feather dusters and give the country a good once over. This is in the Telegraph, Sajila. So, yeah, I, a chain gang prisoners help give country a spring clean. Chain gang, I don't know if I like that sort of term. I don't know what that brings to mind. So, basically, um, what they've decided is that they're going to uh, like make prisoners you know, pay back their dues to society is get them in uh, luminous uh, fluorescent jacketed chain, uh, uh, fluorescent jackets. And uh, these chain gangs will uh, uh, basically be visible to, to you know, the community and they can pay their debt to society by clearing, um, you know, fields, clearing streets and gardens. and. Uh, all will they be attached spots. to each other in some way? Uh, no, no <laughs> they, they make it quite clear that they are chain gangs saw chains. All so right. without so just the chain, gangs. Yeah. I thought yeah. we were trying to crack down on that. I know, those. I know. It's, that's what I'm saying. It's a really problematic kind of <laughs> chain gang. It's, it's, it sounds really... It's all part of the Keep Britain Tidies annual spring clean. But right. I think that's a good thing because they, it gets them outdoors, you know. Um, it cleans up our streets and it, it just reminds them not to be a criminal again. Otherwise, they're going to go back to their fluorescent mm. little numbers. I mean, it's just... You, I mean, you just used to call it community service <laughs> and you just have to do some... I mean, I, I, if I ever found myself falling foul of the law for wearing the wrong coat. Um, yeah, I'd rather do that than go to prison or something. So, But it's it's just the politicians trying to act tough. Let's call it a chain gang so that when we're being interviewed on TV, we can say, oh, we're tough on crime because, look, we're, we're pretending we're chaining them up. We've always done stuff like this. It's not a bad idea. Well, if I was physically chained to anyone, it would certainly be those two. And on that rather erotic <laughs> note, that's the end of this part. We've saved our best till last. Really excited about the final part of the show. We'll discuss life on Venus. Would you live there? House prices are very competitive. A blind mystic who predicted the war in Ukraine. What else has she predicted? And the worst musical ever made, for which there is much competition. See you shortly.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Headliners with me, Mark Dolan, a look at tomorrow's papers. And straight out of witness protection tonight are Sajila Kershi <laughs> and Steve N. Allen. Sorry, Bob Miggins. <laughs> now, the Mail on Sunday has a story about Dominic Raab taking a stand on the issue of free speech. Steve. I'm going to do it again, where I'm just going to get all angry about the choice of words and how pointless some people are. I, I would, if I had hair, I'd pull it out, but I can't reach my back in this shirt. So, um, <laughs> free speech is to get legal supremacy, according to Dominic Raab, as he unveils plans to stop a democratic debate being whittled away by wokery. Eh, that's the button where I move in and go, all right, so let me tell you what's happening there. Yeah. Dominic Raab's using the word woke because everyone thinks they know what it means and they hate it and the enemy of my enemy is my friend, what, you're against woke stuff, then I'm in favour of you, Dominic Raab. If you fall for that, you've not thought it through enough. I'm in favour of free speech. But the idea that you're using it to stop people saying stuff back to you, then, well, what's that person got who disagrees with the free speech you've just used? In fact, there was a bit in the article. It said, uh, they're unveiling plans to replace Labour's Human Rights Act with the British Bill of Rights. Probably got a little flag on the printed out version, I imagine. Uh, he says it will become a, a trump card. The changes will protect media freedom, good, uh, allowing press to continue to expose corruption and wrongdoing, brilliant, and allow individuals to speak their mind. Just remember that includes the people who disagree with what you've just said, who will disagree with you, and then you'll go, well, I can't say anything these days. So it's, yeah, they're heading down that, uh, making a pointless argument when it's not there. But they've got a trump card. So presumably we'll get that in the post. So the moment that you're not happy about anything, then you just say, Duh -uh. It's a card. It's, I've got my card, so you need to like listen to what I'm saying. Well, that's a really good point, because <laughs> some people will try and use the phrase, it's free speech, to shut down yeah. the debate that will be happening with me going, no, I totally disagree with you. How dare you say that? Oh, you can't say anything these days. Both I know, sides I of the know. argument are free speech. And I agree with the wokery. I'm so tired of that wokery. I'm really, really bored with it. But I do think that um, we are walking on eggshells a lot more. So people in the public eye, even now earlier on, I just said what I said uh, about trans. I'm thinking they're thinking, oh, no. And so 80 percent of us have got have been having constipation for the last couple of years. And I think that would alleviate maybe a little bit more, because if we are freer to say our thoughts, remember debate, remember discussion, those things that were really important, for society to exist, that could perhaps be encouraged. But I agree, I don't want to agree with Dominic Raab. Uh, do, you, do you not think, though, that free speech does need protecting, that it's not a given? Uh, yes, no, I'm in favour of protecting free speech. And that that should be in, in, in statute, because, you know, if you look at, for example, an encounter that happened on this very programme, Leo Curse, of this parish, 
was accused of a racist joke by Victoria Corrin Mitchell just a few days ago. He said satirically that Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe is Iranian for ungrateful. He was pick up, picking up on the fact that the word ungrateful was trending after her press conference. It was a satirical remark. She played the racism card. Leo needs protection at that point, doesn't he? No, and I'll tell you why. You could put freedom of speech in the, the first, you know, we could have a constitution and make it right there at the top, but the same conversation would still happen because he was free to say the thing he said and she was mm. free to disagree with it. So I don't think the story would have panned out any differently other than some people would have said, oh, it's freedom of speech. So we, he had the freedom of speech to say that on TV and she was free to... But what about it. this wider cancel culture in which then he gets cancelled from tours or there are certain venues he's not allowed to play? We've seen that for so many artists recently, haven't we? But how would this change that then? So freedom of speech could become a law, a trump card. What are you going to call up a venue and say, how dare you remove my bookings for, for that month? Freedom of speech. Put me back on playing the old. Well, tourist. potentially, if he's been prejudged for simply expressing an opinion, perhaps he could have recourse, uh, recourse to actually uh, consult his lawyers. Probably breach of contract, which he already has at the moment. If yeah. they, if he signed a contract, to, say, he, if any performer would sign a contract yeah. to perform at a venue, I think the laws are already in place. I agree with freedom of speech. I think maybe it does need greater protection. I don't know if our system is that much worse than America's, though, okay. which actually enshrines it. Well, there you go. Well, this is headline as the home of free speech, of course. Now, with such a dramatic life story, you'd have thought that Princess Diana would be the ideal topic for a musical, but not according to The Observer, Sajila. Um, OK, so uh, I've never heard of the Razzie. So the Razzie... Uh, Diana the Musical named worst film at the awards. The Razzies are basically uh, awards, uh, uh, sort of an alternative to the Oscars where the worst films um, are received uh, a little nod. So the film um, version of the Broadway musical based on the life of Diana, Princess of Wales, has won top prize at the 42nd Golden Raspberry Awards. Hmm. Now, um, it's called the Razzies and it honours the worst movies handing out gongs for what they deem to be the lowest lowlights of the Hollywood year. I don't think Diana the Musical sounded like a great idea in the first place. Um, I mean, it got nine nods for Diana the Musical. Worst picture, worst actress, worst director, worst ending. The judges <laughs> felt that the ending was just like a, a bit of a, well, it was just a bit of a car, car crash, really. So Not great. Not a good look. Uh, not a great uh, legacy for the wonderful Diana. On to the Sunday Times now. And the goodie bags for celebrities at the Oscars are getting ever more extravagant, Steve. Yeah, I prefer the, the Razzies to the Oscars because, yeah. you know, I've, I end up watching those films. These ones I never have. But <laughs> you turn up, you get it's given a, a bag, a goodie bag of free things to say, well done, you're a millionaire actor who manages to do for a living what people can only dream of and get paid well for it. Have more free things. And in this year's bag, uh, it includes a small, the rights to a small plot of land in Scotland that it's claimed gives you the right to the Scottish aristoc uh, aristocratic title of Laird, Lord or Lady of Glencoe, I believe it is. Turns out it's not as solid and watertight as it seems that owning a small patch of land could give you the right to be a Laird or a Lord. Who would have thought that there might be an issue with this? <laughs> um, they, it's odd that they're giving it to actors anyway, because what's this just going to mean that the credits roll by and all you just see is like Laird, Lord, Laird, unless if they're not using the titles, it was a waste of money. That's right, because uh, Ben Kingsley has always been teased for the fact that in every film he's dubbed as Sir Ben Kingsley. Sir Ben Kingsley. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, you can buy these things online, a little patch of land, which doesn't give you the right to call yourself a lord or a laird or a lady. But of course it wouldn't. You buy, you know, like my back garden doesn't give me the right to be the lord of Hertfordshire. So I, I'm surely no one's surprised by this. Uh, but and there's other things in this goodie bag as well. If you add it all together, it's worth £76,000, which is the equivalent of three tanks of petrol. Mm. Um, and you can also get, not only that, they, they do you a breast lift, if you fancy. I'd get more use out of that than the title. <laughs> Now you're talking, <laughs> especially if your movie got a bad review. Yeah. Have you had any good freebies in your career in showbiz, you guys? So, actually, at the awards, comedy awards, the year that I was in a, in a, in a, in a well, what's it called? The, it used to be the Perrier, but I think it was called the If Dot Comedies, or the way the year that we won it. And um, per the, Perrier Award is the best shorthand, the isn't per it? The Perrier Award is. The, we're still going to call it the Perrier, right? Because that sounds better. Um, comedy and, Oscars. Yeah, comedy Oscars. It was. I got a pen, a little bag. <laughs> I got a little bag, and I was like, and then, and then there was a free bar. Uh, and we get right. to go and perform the show in between the, the thing. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I was, I was like, your glass of champagne. And I came back and I thought, oh, God, all the good stuff's going to go. So I said, can I just, uh, no, actually put it in a pint glass. 
Because like, you know, so, so yeah, because I'm a classy bird, the pint of champagne. But yeah, a pen and a and like um, I thought it's just it's just it's a pen and a little badge and a little yeah. pin. That's really crap. Because when you well, asked me had any freebies, I thought I've never got any freebies. And when your anecdote was a pen, I thought in comparison, I've probably been given pens. I just yeah. didn't write them off as benefits in kind on my self-assessment form. Yeah, but I mean, they get they've probably got a moon swatch, moon watch squatch. That's where all the swatches have gone, actually. Probably. Yeah, that's probably right. Bags, yeah. I got free tea bags at a radio station I was working, and I just thought it was worth it for years of being on the road as a comedian, struggling in the world of the media. Uh, the reason they were free is because they were flavoured as, um, I think they were biscuit flavoured tea bags. Ew. Yeah. Oh, that's wasted and, all the girth, the short yeah. circuit. Uh, discovered very quickly why they were handing them out for nothing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I've got a really, for some reason, in terms of freebies, I've got a through line of televisions in my life in terms of freebies. And I'm, I'm on a hat trick at the moment because my dear parents used to rent a telly when I was a kid, I think for about four quid a month. And that was, that was the done thing in the 70s because TVs were disproportionately a lot more expensive. So a good telly would have been the equivalent of maybe a grand, a grand and a half. So you just paid a rental. It was good because if it broke, they'd come around and fix it for nothing. Rumblos was one of the companies. And anyway, I can see I'm boring you, but... No, 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 no. I, 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 I promise you, <laughs> for our older know. viewers, they'll know all about radio rentals and, and Rumblos. You rented... You, I was in a flat share. We rented a fridge once, for God's sakes, for a year. But anyway, bring back rented goods. This telly was four quid a month, and we paid... For, and my dad paid for it forever. And I was like, Dad, at what point do you own the telly? He's like, oh, you never do. He said, you just rent it forever. Anyway, but then this company that we rented it from just went bust. And we just had a free telly. Free telly. That's and it carried cool. on for a, a good few more years. Oh, wow, that was that's really cool. Well, then, weirdly, years later, I was working for a, a TV company and they wanted me to, to do a, an event all about 3D TV. So he said, what we're going to do, we're going to lend you a 3D telly and we'll collect it on Monday. No way. Well, they never came back. No way, that's amazing. They never came back. Do you know the best bit about it? It still works and it's, it's big. And Mrs Dolan would never let me have had a big telly like that. But you see, they might remember she's that. A, just... She's a minimalist, so she'd want to have some crappy little small screen. <laughs> so we're like, I'm afraid it was free. What am I going to do, dear? They might, they might be listening and they'll probably come back and... Oh, that reminds us, we've got to get Mark Dolan's TV back. <laughs> I've actually outed myself. What a huge mistake. <laughs> I've moved house. You won't find me. Controversy at a competition for sled dogs next. This in The Observer, Sir Julia. OK, so... Uh, oh, God, I, don't know if, I should have asked someone to pronounce this. Iditarod? 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 Iditarod Sledders. Yeah, you got it right. Iditarod Sledders punished for sheltering dogs during winter storms. So they have like um, uh, the, the, the races with the with, with the dogs, with the sledge dogs. It's a, it's a name, isn't it? It's whatever, what's the name? Um, and what they've done is a, a three of them, uh, because it's really harsh conditions out there in Alaska, um, and they have to have their dogs outside. But because they, they felt sorry for the dogs um, because they were cold, three of them bought them inside. And then they were effectively accused of cheating because the dogs had been, like, sheltered. Ridiculous. In the storm. And I know, it's, it's like animal cruelty. So Pet has got into it. They condemned the Alaska race, as do I, I think, because I think it's quite cruel. And they said that somehow that they had an advantage. So the, the three people competing were Milia Poslid of Denmark, Michelle Phillips of Canada, Riley Dyke of Fairbanks. They were penalised for taking their dogs inside uh, shelter cab uh, cabins to ride out the storm Surely saving the lives of the dogs was more important. It's, it is it is a no-brainer. What a howler of a story. Never mind Mars, the race is on to discover life on Venus. Sunday's Daily Star have got this, Yeah, Steve. a space race, Mark II. It's NASA versus China. Who's going to get there first? And what happens if China wins? Oh, nothing. Um, but apparently <laughs> the chief designer of China's lunar exploration program has announced that China will be conducting... Uh, their own mission to Venus. Okay. Don't know why he's chipping in? He's in the lunar section. Uh, no, no, your remit, man. Come on. Uh, um, but the Houston-based NASA said that they also hope to send some missions to try and see if the chemistry is right, if there are Venusians, which I think is the appropriate phrase. Um, but also, as with all of these stories, where we all get excited and the, the uh, tabloids say, "Oh, aliens and all that," um, calm down. They're not going to be sexy Venus people. It's just going to be bacteria. The best that you can ever hope for is the kind of stuff that we use alcohol hand rub to kill. <laughs> stuff that you tr actively buy stuff to kill every day. We'll try and see if we can find it on Venus. So, big whoop. There'll be slightly more germs out there if they manage to find it. Um, yeah.
Yeah, is, is Venus as disappointing as Tenerife? That's the question. On to Sunday's Telegraph now and a story about burglar alarms falling silent, Sajila. Ah, oh, so burglar alarms uh, to stop working as BT tears out copper landlines. Mm. Now, um, anybody who's got burglar alarms that was sort of tapped into their BT lines, um, they had better get new ones by 2025, because it's all changing before then. All homes and businesses will be moved to a new system by then, and landlines will be cut off. Around 1.5 million BT customers have already had their landlines taken away. Right. Um, this is this again. I mentioned like the, the the most vulnerable, you know, society being at the top end and the at tail end of of you know like, like youths and and when you're older. This is going to affect the elderly because they they could easily become a target for um, criminals. Uh, if they haven't sorted this out. And uh, it's going to cost them £500 to replace their existing alarm, so they probably won't be able to afford that either. Yeah. So it's a, it's a bit of a worry. I don't have any alarms. I'm deaf, and I just quite happily would just get burgled, I think. Nobody, oh. And I'll probably just outed myself to the burglars as well. I think you might have done. Okay. Yeah, but I keep my hearing aids on all night long, all right? They're going to have a busy night. They've got to go and get my flat screen telly, <laughs> which, by the way, let me stress, is about 15 years old now. It's, it's almost black and white. Steve, uh, you, you're the man of the house. You don't have to worry about burglar alarms. They just take one look at you and Scarpa, don't they? Leave it out, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The do you want some? That's all I do, yeah. I just stand outside my front door like a bouncer all night, just in case. Um, I mean, look, it's technology needs to catch up with it. I, why have you not upgraded your burglar alarms by now to be all integrated with your Wi-Fi? And by the way, top tip, Make yourself a secondary Wi-Fi network in the home so you don't have your, um, your peripheral type devices connected to that. Makes it much harder for people to hack. Get you, Inspector Gadget. Last but not least, Sunday's Irish mirror, Steve, a latter-day Nostradamus. What's the story? The story of a blind psychic who's predicted many things, including that uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin would become the Lord of the World. <gasps> Scary stuff. Oh so why are you telling us this now, newspapers? Why don't you mention it when we were sat here talking about Putin's amassing troops on the borders? <laughs> that would have been the time to mention that there was a prediction. Uh, this is Bulgarian Baba Vanga, who passed away in 1996, uh, aged 85, referred to as the Nostradamus of the uh, Balkans, uh, predicted, well, apparently most of her predictions are accurate. It's an important word, that most in that sentence. Like, eh, some of them are a bit vague. But anyway, she says, nobody can stop Russia kind of feels like Ukrainian forces are a little bit. They've not mentioned that in the story. <laughs> no. Definitely. Any, any news on interest rates or anything like that? No, but um, aliens will invade the planet by sending an asteroid to seek out life and it will have an unfriendly outcome. And in the future, more people will spend time in front of screens. Which one is it? <laughs> I mean, are we going to be enslaved... Enslaved by aliens to watch more tell. Now you're talking. I have one prediction, which is that Steve and Sajila will be back soon. Brilliant stuff, guys. I'm back tomorrow at 9. See you then. Hello there. I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and every weekday we bring you The Briefing live from 9.30am. The stories, analysis and live debate that you need to hear. Quite right, uh, uh, Tom, of, of course. Was this something that had been considered at all? Difficult to answer. Gas guzzling helicopters circling. Noise is being made here. Joe Biden walking out. Thank you very much for joining us. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, Monday to Friday, 9.30am on GB News. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. 
This is Headliners, Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed.